This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you. Welcome to the People Speak Radio Show. I'm your host, Samantha Legend. The People Speak airs every Tuesday, 6 to 7 p.m. Pacific, 9 to 10 Eastern on BBS Radio Network. You can participate during the show with call in questions for our guests toll free in the USA and Canada at 1 888 429 5471. And if you have a smartphone, you can download our app at BBS Radio Douglas Newsom. Tonight we have a special guest, Larry Payne. Larry is a yoga teacher sharing his gift of health with his famous books, Yoga for Dummies and Yoga RX. Larry has a series of Yoga RX and Prime of Life DVDs, which focus on boosting immunity, weight management, common back problems, and restorative health. They are all available on his website, samata.com, S-A-M-A-T-A dot com. Larry is a pioneer in the field of yoga therapy, and he created the International Association of Yoga Therapists. His website is www.iayt.com. Larry is also the co-founder of the Yoga Curriculum at UCLA School of Medicine. Welcome, Larry. It's truly a pleasure to have you here. I Thank found you, your book, Samantha, and also it's a pleasure for me because you and I have become friends, and I admire and respect uh, what you're doing. Uh, so I just wanted to clear up one. Uh, the, my website is uh, samata.com, S-A-M-A-T-A, and the website for the International Association of Yoga Therapists is the other one you did, IAYT, which I'm co-founder with my dear friend, Dr. Richard Miller. It's a wonderful website. I mean, people are actually able to go there and find a trained yoga therapist that you trained. 25 years it's been since uh, Richard and I started it, and now the executive director, John Kepner, has been our longest-running director and has done really great things for us. So we're all really proud of this organization, as well as um, the new Yoga Therapy Rx program at Loyola Marymount University, which now just made its 10th year. I'm actually very proud to call you a friend. I'm so happy to meet you. Good. My pleasure. I found your book very educational and inspiring, and your DVDs, very healing. I want to thank you. There's nothing better than the gift of health. I mean, I feel so much better. Well, you know, just in the days of nice having. You're going to be in an interview with somebody and have a chance to really look at the things. And I know you took the time to do that. And uh, so that's also helpful for everybody else that you're talking to, you know, on the, your whole network. So I, I appreciated that. Well, I'm so happy with the results. <laughs> uh, seriously, I have only been doing it, what, a week? Mm-hmm. Or I've got them about a week and a half ago, right? So I, so it took a little while to get me get them. But they are amazing. I feel better energy, get better rest. I'm so amazed in how well, much I've improved. Thank you very much. Uh, Larry, I'll, send you, I'll send you your check in the mail. wonderful wonderful oh that's great so Larry what led you to the path of yoga and meditation well mine I think is an interesting one I I was actually an advertising executive I was the west coast manager of advertising sales for McCall's magazine which was a a, a high pressure job and uh, I developed a back problem and I went to a lot of the doctors in L.A., and we have some good ones. And nobody could figure this thing out. And so finally my running partner, 
<clears throat> literally dragged me to a yoga class. Unfortunately, it was a compassionate yoga teacher. She was an elder lady who was a disciple of Indra Devi, who I later met and became one of my teachers. And um, I said to her, I was watching people warm up. I said, I can't do that stuff. And she goes, just take your time at the end of the class. You'll get a surprise. And son of a gun, she was right. At the end of the class, she did a 10-minute relaxation. And this back pain that I had that felt like a dog bite, like for a year, was gone. And it lasted for four hours. And I felt like I was high. It was a very uh, wonderful, strange feeling. And I said, this is for me. And I just jumped into it full on. I found a teacher close to me and really started getting into it. Well, your DVDs and your book has made me jump into it. I am definitely going to be doing yoga the rest of my life. Wonderful. So... In your book, Yoga for Dummies, you provide many essential health benefits for well-being. Can you share some of them? Yes. This is the third edition of Yoga for Dummies. And by the way, Wiley Publishing is incredible. I mean, it's, that book is in over 12 languages. And they mm. keep coming out with revising. We always add a little more. And later on, I'll tell you about the latest book that's coming out um, for yoga therapy. But, um, you know... The main health benefits of yoga, number one, hands down, is stress reduction. So, you know, the American Medical Association says that 80% of all illness has a stress component. So if you can have a do-it-yourself program or go to a class and walk out and reduce your stress, that's a big deal. It really is. Um, The other thing is that Almost all doctors like the fact that it's very good for your circulation. And there are tests now that show that as far as your heart and so forth, you get a lot of the same benefits as if you were running or something. I mean, it's like an amazing um, system of holistic health. And then most people will think about that yoga is just about stretching or something like that, but it's really uh, about balance. So you know, strength and flexibility. So you don't have to be a uh, Gumby to do yoga. And um, and also, if you're someone who needs strength, you, you can get, you know, both of those. Another one, and I'm just picking my top five. You could go on, if you go to the IAYT website, it'll give you like uh, 200 things. But <laughs> these are my top five. The next one is willpower concentration. So you wouldn't think that doing a yoga practice would have anything to do with opening the refrigerator door, but it does. I mean, you, one practice, one discipline helps all your other disciplines. And the last one is what I experienced in that class, which was this overall sense of well-being. And I don't want to just go on and on, but I one other thing I want to say about it is it really hit home Back in the 80s, I started the corporate yoga program at the J. Paul Getty Museum. And um, at that time, they were in Malibu, and now they have one in Brentwood. And I actually, my programs are still going in both of them. But uh, where we did yoga was two doors down from the head of security in what used to be J. Paul Getty's uh, dining room. And so mm-hmm. after I had been there about three months, the head of security invited me in, said he wanted to see me. <laughs> i tell you something, I was nervous. And so I came in, he said, sit down, Larry, is that something I need to tell you? I said, yeah. He goes, since you've been teaching yoga here, everybody who passes by my door is nicer to me. <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious that he was serious. You, you get in such a wonderful mood, and it has a ripple effect. And here in Los Angeles is the mecca for yoga. And so there are literally, you know, in Santa Monica, California, <laughs> there's people walking around in a state of euphoria all the time <laughs> from all these uh, yoga classes here. So the, those are my top five. Well, I'm enjoying the state of euphoria now because I just did the the neck, upper back workout before this oh, class, yeah, that's before a good one. this. So I that's feel a great. Good one. That's a good one. Um, is there any potential for harm or injury during yoga? 
I mean, how can people avoid them? I mean, well, with your really classes, is, and they're, now there are, uh-huh. there are, there are, you know, there was a magazine article in the New York Times about said yoga can wreck you, and um, it's true. Uh, if you go to the wrong class and you have the wrong attitudes, so here's what happens: is that um, in India, yoga was met for three stages of life. And if you really give credit to the person who has more than anyone, according to Wikipedia and uh, many other sources, um, inspired yoga, uh, modern yoga, his name was Krishna Macharya, like Hare Krishna, Krishna Macharya. And uh, he sent two real famous people to America. One was a guy named BKS Iyengar, who just passed away, who was amazing. And another one was Patabi Joyce, and uh, both of these people learned yoga when they were 16 years old from him. Hmm. Later, he sent his son, who was my teacher, TKB Deskachar. Now, what happened is that this yoga that came here that was designed for young boys, it was real popular. A lot of people were doing it. But then all of a sudden, people that weren't in the right either uh, state of fitness or the right age were walking into classes where um, people were doing crazy things like one-arm handstands and things like that, and they're getting injured. So if you look at the life of a professional athlete, I always use this analogy, they, they're they out of the game by the time they're in their late 30s or 40s. Kobe Bryant's talking about retiring at 36. So... The body definitely changes, and by 40, for sure. So if professional athletes have to modify what they're doing at different stages, then it makes sense that we in the yoga class should modify what we're doing. And unfortunately, the people over 40 are the most underserved group in in America, and I'm doing something about that. Now, this doesn't take away anything from the value of yoga for, you know, the young and restless, you know, Uh, something from like 15 to like, you know, 40, that's fine. But just for this largest segment of the population, in my opinion, the yoga should be modified. And that also, in my opinion, this is why people are getting injured, because they're going to a place and they're trying to, you know, fit in or they, you know, they have old football tapes or whatever it is, especially guys. And uh, they get injured. So you you know, there are, there are some definite um, principles that you should uh, practice when you're when you're uh, taking the class, and also for the teacher. I am so glad you let us know and let me know because <laughs> I guess I'm spoiled because I mean I have the number one yoga therapist right here on my and DVDs teaching me how to do things, you know. Yeah. I I really suggest everyone do that. Get these DVDs. They're working for me. Um, this oh, is the people speak. Huh? Well, the, there's, um, you know, the, uh, the book Yoga for Dummies really talks about how to pick a class. Uh, and what's funny is, you know, the name is a turnoff to some people, you know, the dummies. But people who have written, you know, read any of these yoga, for any of these dummies books, they're all very good. And uh, I know a lot of yoga teachers in L.A. who have a copy. They don't take it out and show anybody, but it's always in their back pocket. <laughs> There's some great things. And my co-author, who unfortunately passed away about a year and a half ago, uh, Dr. Georg Feuerstein, um, he had all of the philosophy things in there that are ageless, you know, principles about yoga philosophy and so forth so it it has a lot of good things in it definitely well you have yoga therapy rx which includes common upper back and neck problems weight management for people with curves common lower back problems and then women's health and also we have the prime of life yoga which i'm enjoying too i mean this we know those principles is great. Of time of life yoga is, uh, could apply to anybody who wants to just take it sort of an easier start or beginners and so forth. But how I describe prime of life is 
that uh, I was at a party uh, in Santa Monica, and this man was there. He was 55, and he was talking to me, and he said he went to three different yoga classes, and he couldn't even do anything in the class. It was just driving him nuts. He says, here I am in the prime of my life, and I can't even do yoga. And so that name stuck with me because when you really think about it, a lot of people are in their prime 40-something to 70-something. You know, they're at the top of their game and what they're doing. They're making more income. They have their families around them. And that's a wonderful time in life, 40-something to 70-something. And there's a lot of websites that say 50-plus yoga, but I I think it's more like 40-something to 70-something that people can do this kind of stuff, a little modified. And um, I don't you know, think there's an age limit of being on your prime. I think, no, yeah, I I think this comment. prime of life is is a winner for me. I want to tell everybody, this is the People Speak. Anyone just tuning in, I'm Samantha Legend, talking to our guest Larry Payne about his series of Yoga Rx and Prime of Life DVDs. He has the famous book Yoga for Dummies, all available on his website, somata.com. And we're here on BBS Radio. Thank you. Um, the other book I so just wanted to mention to you that's just coming out like in a week is called Yoga Therapy uh, and Integrative Medicine. Uh, and um, this is a conglomerate of some of the top minds in the country that are doctors, yoga therapists, and every kind of health profession. Uh, and it's um, kind of overview of what yoga therapy is and some of its main principles, and it's going to be something that um, really uh, becomes a big deal because yoga therapy is one of the next new things, uh, and uh, it's it's uh, done by Basic Health, so you can go to Amazon and see it, and uh, it's it's just just coming out as we speak. Well, Larry, as soon as this can, you can release a copy of this. I look forward to getting it to have you right back to talk more about this because oh, there's very much. so much information in this Yoga for Dummies book. Thank I mean, you. it goes like you were saying; it goes so much into how to choose your class. I mean, even to where, I mean, even if you have the wrong vibe with the yoga teacher, yeah. you know, <laughs> your true. observations of the yoga teacher. Yeah, um, it's the size of the class. I mean, you break it down, I mean, really closely of how to analyze to get the most out of your class. Thank you very much. Um, another thing is with, that you notice now is that yoga is really popular. I mean, you can't even turn on television without somebody using it in an ad, on TV series. You know, they're like, it's everywhere. So it's kind of like, you know, why is it so popular, you know? And, and I, I think it goes back to that it really is something that you can do to reduce stress because all of our lives now with all of the media and their cell phones and the TVs and the computers and all that are just creating so much stress. And here's something that, you know, you can pop in a DVD or go to a class and, uh, you know, you can improve the situation. And uh, it's just booming. And like I've mentioned before, Los Angeles, California, especially Santa Monica, is like the mecca for yoga. And it's really kind of funny. Everywhere you go, somebody's walking around with a yoga mat. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, here's something else, too. I'm that... glad. I'm just going to do have mine. I mean, I'm Thank using my you. DVDs, and I'm sticking with them. So. Thank you. Uh, the um, same man I mentioned, Krishnamacharya, mm-hmm. who got the credit for being you know, the person responsible for modern yoga, uh, back in the, oh the the like I would say late sixties early seventies, he got his first ever Western male middle age student, and his name was Dr. Albert Franklin. His daughter's still alive in the Midwest, Anne Franklin, and um, he was the ambassador to India from uh, from America, and so. When Krishnamacharya worked with him, he started to modify his practice. So that was the first time after he sent over these two um, representatives, Patabi Joyce and B.K. Sayangar, 
that he had something a little different. This is what I call the contemporary teachings of Krishnamacharya and more modern yoga. And so he called it Vini Yoga, which means that you adapt the yoga to the whole person. And there's still, um, you know, Vini Yoga America with Gary Kraftsaw, who's an excellent teacher. And um, the, 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 the name changed over, there was a, some political things, but that, that principle still works really well. And so those are the principles I use for my prime of life yoga. Um, and But what's interesting to me is the same giant, the same man who was so popular for the mo- you know modernizing the yoga, especially for younger people, also has this other chapter that has to do with people from midlife and beyond. Hmm. Um, we actually have a question here from Mike in California. Hey, Mike. Are there... <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Mike. Um, Are there any prerequisites, apparatus, or physical requirements necessary for doing yoga? Can a disabled person do this? Absolutely. And what happens is that it brings up the topic of yoga therapy. So yoga therapy is designed really, I mean, there's pages about the definition of yoga therapy at the IAYT website, but... um, Yoga therapy is mainly for people who don't fit in a group class. They have some need. It could be physical, emotional, spiritual, something that doesn't function in a group class. They usually need one-on-one attention. So then there are also special groups, like we call them focus groups, whereas there might be a whole group of people that I taught for the MS Society, um, and there's a group of people that have Parkinson's or they have low back or, you know, they're wheelchair bound or any of those things um, either fall into yoga therapy like one-on-one or into one of these focus groups where everybody has kind of the same condition. So absolutely, uh, you know, you don't need any kind of pre-anything. And um, if you're doing your yoga, all you basically need is a yoga mat or if you're in a wheelchair, uh, you can do it in a chair, and there's a, all kinds of um, new videos about you know chair yoga and restorative yoga, which was something that BKS Iyengar started later on. Uh, and so, I would say, I if you can breathe and <laughs> you can think, you can do yoga. What do you think that? Um, people should do as far as yoga off the mat to prepare for the yoga? It's a beautiful question because not only is it to prepare, it's like what you do when you start practicing yoga. So there's a lot of realms. First is the physical realm, and one of the ones that I teach the yoga therapist at Loyola Marymount University, our Yoga Therapy Rx program, is that, you know, Walking is something that people take. The, a couch potato takes 2,000 steps in a day. So the average person is somewhere like five to 10,000 steps. So if, if you have something that's not correct in your walk, uh, that, that, you know, times 2,000, 5,000 times, that, that's a big deal. So I teach them about the body mechanics, like off the mat, um, and uh, so I call it a biomechanical re-education. And I, I learned a lot of that from my early mentor, Dr. Leroy Perry, at the International Sports uh, Science Institute in, in, uh, in West Los Angeles. So um, how you walk, and these are the physical things, how you sit, how you sleep, and seriously, how you make love. These are all things that you could improve uh, with a lifestyle practice, then you have the whole mental part of it and um, spiritual part of it. So yoga has eight limbs, and half of them <clears throat> are about how you treat other people and how you treat yourself and then how you evolved through things like, um, you know, sense withdrawal and, you know, advanced breathing and meditation and you know, on your path towards enlightenment. So there's 
all of that as well. And, you know, people don't realize is that the original yoga um, was handed down, was all about the mind. So it, it, you could say that yoga is maybe 5,000 years old, but the postures that people do are only about 1,000 years old. And this is usually under the category called hatha, and most of us mispronounce it, hatha. We've Americanized it. It's hatha yoga. Those are all about the physical practices. Then you have the other aspects like meditation and, you know, how you treat other people, how you take care of yourself um, that are beautiful, and they're laid out nicely in what is called the Yoga Sutra. So Sutra is a condensed nugget of spiritual wisdom, and um, there's about 195 of these, some people say 196, that are in this uh, system that was first put into written word somewhere like 200 A.D. or 200 B.C., and uh, now it's been translated thousands of times. And so, you know, people don't realize that yoga is a, is a very, very incredibly comprehensive system that acts like a booster rocket for almost anything. And it's not a religion, but some religions incorporate some of the principles in their ceremonies and things like that. But yoga by itself is really an incredible, probably the original holistic health. Hmm. That was a mouthful. Um, no, 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 please. I, I love this. I love this. Um, you know, you touched on a few things that I wanted to get into deeper. Um, I, one of them was the eight limbs of yoga. Uh-huh. I specifically want to get into the spiritual aspects of yoga, the yama and the niyama. Uh-huh. Yeah, I wanted... Um, our listeners to hear this because a lot of people have these misconceptions about yoga being a religion, you know, on itself. So I wanted to get into this. I mean, because it's kind of the cherry on top of, you know, a religion because of the moral disciplines and the self self restraint that is incorporated in this whole way of life. Well, um, <clears throat> We can start with, again, about that yoga is not a religion. <clears throat> I call it a booster rocket. Um, and how it gets confusing is that the very first yoga teachers to come to America, uh, 1893, was Vivekananda. Um, he was basically a Hindu monk. And then Swami Shivananda sent his two disciples, Vishnu Devananda and Swami Satchitananda, and they were Hindu monks, and they also taught yoga. So people were a little confused. You know, they wore robes and all this kind of stuff. But when Krishnamacharya sent his disciples over, they were what is called householders. They were married, had kids. And so this was much more appealing to a lot of the people in America and became, you know, much more popular. But what you talk about as the eight limbs or the core of yoga, um, there's the yamas, you know, uh, the do's and don'ts, if you want to say, there's a, you know, yama, niyama. There's asana, which is body postures, uh, and that's all part of hatha yoga. There is pranayama, prana meaning life force, ayama, to control or extend. Pratyahara, control of the senses. Dharana, which is concentration, exercises. Dhyana, uh, meditation. And then samadhi. And, you know, samadhi, I, I haven't met too many people who really reach samadhi, you know. And some people use that term lightly and so forth. But um, I, I haven't met too many who got there. Uh, I have met some uh, when I was in India. And uh, but those are the eight limbs that you were talking about. Yeah, I was really interested in the moral discipline, the yama uh-huh. of of yoga. Uh-huh. I I find that very intriguing. Well, it is, and uh, um, it, it it you know these are all steps. Uh, you know about uh, the first one, yama is about you know how you treat other people. Um, mm-hmm. 
And uh, like, for instance, ahimsa, which is non-violence, non-harming. That's like the number one. Satya, truthfulness. Asteya, non-stealing. Uh, brahmacharya, which is says celibacy, but how that applies to people who are married is that you're true to whoever your mate is, that you're not a yoga teacher or somebody out there just jumping around being a playboy or something <laughs> like that, you know. And uh, aparigraha is, uh, you know, non-covet, non-possessive, like that. Um, so that's the one that you're, I think you're, you're, you're mainly interested in. Yes, yes, because, I mean, it's, it's putting it all in, you know, all different aspects, you know, the heart, body, mind, you know, body, mind, spirit, you know, the whole unity, the yoke that yoga, you know, is, the character of yoga, you know. Definitely. And um, I, when now, I'm learning one, this, you, you know, you it's amazing these, to uh, learn so much. disciplines and so forth. The, the Niyama, which is the next one, um, that has to do with... Um, you know, purity of your of everything, your body, your mind, your speech, and so forth. Uh, called sauka and santosa, contentment, acceptance of others, and so forth. Tapas, persistent meditation, and uh, um, austerity is part of that. And um, svadvaya, the self-study of reflection. And Ishvara Panidharma, which is the study of about God, basically. Um, so you, you know, you can look at all of these, and then the one right after that is the one all about asana, and that is where most people think yoga is. And I think it's really astute of you to be attracted to the very first one, the yamas. <laughs> thing. Yeah, I, I had no idea yoga was so all-encompassing and yeah, way, um, i just want to interject something that is that uh sanskrit pronunciation really helps if you were born in india <laughs> 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 so i i apologize to anybody who's a scholar out there if i uh, mangled any of their pronunciations but that's uh you know from a western standpoint that's pretty close it was it was good for me so right. no worries um, Larry, what is the yoga diet? I was reading that I would looked at the yoga diet and some yogis are not, well, don't to eat um, any onions or garlic. Well, Why is that? see you, it's all about what path you're following. Okay. So the monks, a lot of the monks who are celibate. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's like, they don't want to even think about sex. So they don't, onions and garlic are stimulating. So that's where that comes from, um, is that it would stimulate you to maybe think more of those thoughts. Now, it sounds so crazy to us in this society, but when people are going off to really just ponder God and, you know, just go very within and not be distracted by anything, um, I, I did that for a month. Uh, in my very first training, and I, I, I noticed, uh, you know, a difference. But hmm. when you talk about yoga diet in general, uh, <clears throat> this is always very controversial. So somebody okay. listening... Before is, we uh, get into this controversial yes. area, yes. you know, I want us to take a break, let people, you know, <laughs> oh, sure. kind of listen to this and kind of think about... All the in-depth things you've been talking about. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm your host, Samantha Legend, and we'll be right back w with our guest, Larry Payne. Our number to call in to ask Larry questions is 1-888-429-5471 here on BBS Radio. Land was made for you and me. You're listening to The People Speak here on BBS Radio. I am your host, Samantha Legend, and we're back with our guest tonight, 
Larry Payne about his series of Yoga RX DVDs and the famous Yoga for, for Dummies book, all available on his website, samata.com, S-A-M-A-T-A.com. The number for call-in questions is one 429 5471 Well, Larry, okay, back to our yoga diet and the information you were giving us. Okay. Uh, it's, I was going to say it's a very controversial thing. Like uh, in our courses at Loyola Marymount University, which we've been going on for 10 years now, we, had, we came up to the topic of yoga and diet, and one of the gentlemen stood up in the class and said, if you're not a vegetarian, you're not a yoga teacher. <laughs> and then the whole place went crazy. You know, everybody's talking back and forth. And, you know, when you reach the highest level of near samadhi or something like that, they do recommend that you you have something like a vegetarian diet. But a close cousin, in fact, a sister of yoga, is called Ayurveda. So in India, Ayurveda and yoga both came out of the same philosophy called Samkhya. And uh, uh, Samkhya is written with an M, but it's pronounced Samkhya. And so okay. Ayurveda is a close, you know, sister. So in the textbooks of Ayurveda, they have pages on conditions, like if somebody has asthma, well, they recommend animal protein. Now, people can get upset with me and so forth and so on, but it's there. So I think it's wrong to say that there's any one thing is the yoga diet. Even my teacher, Jessica Char, said there's no one yoga diet. It depends on the person. So depending on your condition, uh, where you live, for instance, this is a mind blower. The Dalai Lama is not a vegetarian. He has a condition where he has to have meat. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can use all of these uh, ideas and so forth, but I would say that what we really want is to have food close to nature. And um, if someone can be a vegetarian, it's great. Um, And, uh, like, there's great um, products out there, uh, like, um, uh, that, that help people, guide them to do these things. Uh, to get on track if they want to try it. But some people try being a vegetarian. It doesn't work for them. People try being, having raw foods. It doesn't work. So I, I believe it's a very individual thing. It depends on your genes and, and uh, you know, many things. But for people who want to be vegetarians, I think forks over knives is a real nice concept. Um, and uh, for people who don't want to be vegetarians, um, and there's many other things. Uh, and also, a lot, someone else did a lot of good work in the, for vegetarians is Dr. Dean Ornish. And, um, but I think a lot of these people, you know, or doctors also realize that some people have special needs. So I think it really depends on you. Uh, read a lot. Try some of these things. And, um, and then decide what's the best for you. Because, of, I, to my opinion... Vegetarian is not for everybody, and also if you're a yoga teacher, less than 10% of the of the United States uh, is a vegetarian, less, way less. So if you only give people advice as a vegetarian, you're losing like 90% of your audience that don't want to do it. So there's another reason. And, you know, I, for those of you listening right now, I totally understand how some people have very different views, so I respect that. I'm just giving you my view. Well, I wanted you to get more into the Ayurveda. Um, you were, you said about the animal protein for asthma. Mm-hmm. Are there any other things that you can I'm add sure to there's that? more, but I'm not an expert mm-hmm. in Ayurveda, so I would not want to insult my friends that teach in <laughs> the course. And, uh, I'm not an expert. I've just had a little bit. Um, I have met some very wonderful Ayurvedic teachers so I would just like to say in the United States, the man who's probably respected the most is a man named Vasant Ladd, who I met okay. early on, who was on the original board member of the International Association of, of Yoga Therapists, and any of his books, also David Frowley. I'm just giving you some of the names okay. uh, that I, you know, I'm familiar with, and, but there's more okay. of them out there. But Ayurveda is the science of life, 
And um, in India, there are a lot of yoga therapy programs that have both. And even here in America now, they, people have both. So uh, in India, you might have an Ayurvedic center that has one room that they do yoga in. Here in America, you have yoga being by far the overwhelming, you know, most popular, but Ayurveda is coming along. And also in here in Los Angeles, we have L.A. Yoga and Ayurveda uh, with Felicia Tabasco, who's an incredible editor, and she bridges both of these worlds and also teaches in our Yoga Therapy Arts course. Okay, everybody, this is The People Speak, and I'm Samantha Legend talking to our guest Larry Payne about his series of Yoga Rx and Prime of Life DVDs and his famous Yoga for Dummies, all available on his website, samata.com, S-A-M-A-T-A, here on BBS Radio. Um, We have a caller on line two. Caller? Hello, Larry. Hi, who is it? Hello, Larry. This is Mike. Hi, Mike. From California. And oh, I have California. a question for you. What part of California? Uh, Southern California. Uh, you're in my hood. And uh, my question for you is, uh, what exactly distinguishes your yoga from other yogas? Uh, because I've been practicing Bikra yoga, and I find it to be rather strenuous, almost athletic in some respects. Uh, what, uh, how do you Well, it's all about who yoga? your teachers are, and uh, Bikram is a very popular style, and his wife, Rajeshwari, was on the, uh, and he was a friend of mine, and the Bikram is an old friend. And so I think that you will find that it is athletic. And uh, actually, if you take his, uh, I think his 26 postures, they're, they're, uh, it's a very good system, but it's intense. You know, you're in heat, and that's not good for everybody. And I think I would personally, after doing this 35 years, I would rate it as sort of an intermediate course. So uh, it's a little harder to do as you get older, you know. And, so uh, you would rate Bikram as an intermediate course as would, opposed to yours, which is for any level? or is that the... No, uh, my particular style that I, I, I have two things I'm involved in. One is yoga therapy, which what I want. But the main thing that I teach is called prime of life yoga. And so I'm focusing on 40 plus, 40 something, which has 120 million people. And it is the most underserved in America. And talk to somebody who's 60, 50, you know, and ask them, you know, when they go in the classes. It's it's hard. Um, so um, what I'm trying to do is trying to, you know, make these principles available. Some of them are this, that at this stage, and again, this is from Christian Macharya, who is the person given credit for being, you know, the father of modern yoga. He taught differently when he got somebody middle-aged. So... So what I'm asking specifically, though, so like your exercises are modified, they aren't extreme positions, or they are the more gentler, easier Yeah, they are modified. For instance, we have something called forgiving limbs. You can soften your arms and legs, and that that, that, that was unheard of when I took my first yoga class. But this is the same guy, Krishnamacharya, who taught all the Iyengar and Batabi Joyce and started to modify for people, like I say, following a professional athlete, when the body changes, shouldn't your yoga change a little bit, you know? And you can have somebody who's doing yoga all their life, and they're a, they're a Jonathan Livingston Siegel, and they could do everything in their 80, 90, but that's the exception. Majority of the people after 45 and up, you know, a little modification helps, and I think that people are getting injured when they're trying to push themselves into something that intuitively doesn't feel right. Also, Larry, because of the different uh, background ethnically, you know, certain countries, they're brought up a certain way, they sit on the floor, or they, you know, they're used to doing that kind of... uh, Absolutely, uh, you're absolutely right. And Americans are not used to that. That's what I'm getting at, you know, what... Yeah, no, you're right. Your yoga... Yeah, Yeah, and and Yoga for Dummies talks about that, Um, and uh, this third edition especially, and uh, you're absolutely right. How old are you, sir, may I ask? Late 20s. Late 20s. Okay. So, I mean, you shouldn't have too much problems. Um, and if you're doing the, the Bikram, I think it's probably really good. You're doing fine in there and you like it. Um, but uh, the, the one that's the most challenging, the most difficult, hands down, 
in my opinion, is Ashtanga Yoga. Very popular uh, from Patabi Joyce, and uh, I think one of its greatest uh, teachers uh, on the West Coast, anyway, in California, is a guy named Tim Miller down in San Diego. And uh, we have a lot of those people across the country. Um, but that's something that, you know, I went to some of these workshops, and you don't see many, too many people over 40 or 50 in one of these uh, kind of workshops. Um, so I, I'm just trying to create a safe place for people, you know, who are over 40. And, you know, the way it is now, because yoga is so popular, it kind of goes like from flow yoga to chair yoga. You know, there's nothing in between. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, you know, you don't have to do wimpy stuff to do prime of life yoga. You know, it's, these are people who are active, out doing st- things, and just you don't want to get injured and have a long, healthy life. Thank you, you so know, much. You know, thank you so much, Mike, for Thanks, calling Michael. in. Appreciate it. Um, you know, when we're dealing with your immune booster and general conditioning, there's, there to me, there's no age limit. It's just... I mean, you are actually getting really good circulation. I mean, you are opening up those those vertebrae, getting circulation in there oh, thank you. gently. You know. Well, I, I just uh, just I'll just play you when I want people to read my by myself. I appreciate. <laughs> no, but it, it really did help for you to see it because you got a chance to experience it firsthand, and really any age bracket can do my particular style, but I've really focused in towards this 40 plus because there's so many other styles for people under 40 and so forth. But um, if if you use these principles, honestly, no matter what age you are, um, they're very good principles that came from Christian Macharya. Mm. Are there any specific supplements you suggest for the, to treat the body? You know, supplementation, vitamins, anything? Well, I, I believe in multivitamins. And okay. um, I think that, you know, you keep having these different studies that one, you know, one year that they're in and the next year they're out. And, you know, but I, I haven't met too many people who overdosed on uh, vitamins. <laughs> you know, it's more like other drugs. So I, I do take supplements. Okay. And uh, I work with Dr. David Allen in, in the, okay. uh, his Longevity Optimization Center in, in Santa Monica, and he's a big proponent of that. And uh, so I, I think for men, you know, uh, there's certain vitamins. For women, certain things they need to take uh, as they move through life. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I do take a multivitamin, plus I have a personalized uh, vitamin schedule I got from my doctor. Or what, what's you know what will be help me. And but, that was uh, David Allen. David Allen, yeah, he's okay. amazing. All right. Um, All and right. um, so, but it's like it's. It, I think you need to work with somebody who's going to give you a blood test. Okay. And then from the blood test, tell you you know what you need this and you need that. And okay. the, you know it's same thing with women and the hormone level, men and their hormone levels. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they need some help, and then you have people, doctors, traditional doctors, who say, "Well, you're in the normal range." The normal range is really huge. So you know, it do you is. Want to be it in is. The bottom, bottom of normal, or do you want to be in the top of normal, in the middle? And so often, some people will say, "Oh, you're normal, but you're way at the bottom of normal." So I, mm. I, I, I believe in the supplements personally, and I've, I've been um, taking them a long time. Sorry to interrupt you, but. And the hormones, you know, one of your restorative health, the women's health, Uh it um, helps with the endocrine issues, you Uh know. So is there any possibility of a person that's on, say, thyroid medication that with these kind of exercises, this high circulation, this high um, opening up lymphatic pathways that you could get off of these medications? My personal opinion is, and I've been around this a long time, because my first mentor was the father of holistic medicine in America. His oh. name was Dr. Everett Loomis, bless his soul. Dr. And Everett? Everett Loomis, father okay. of holistic medicine in America. He had a place called Metalark, and he had to take his thyroid out when he was young, and he was on thyroid medication. 
So I think when it comes to the thyroid, it's pretty hard to get off of it, but they have kind of more natural forms of medicine than hardcore medicines for thyroid. Okay. Synthroid, and, you know, they have different things. But I think that when you have thyroid problems, it's pretty hard to go natural. So that's one mm-hmm. of the ones, uh, this, this is my opinion, and I, I work with a lot of doctors. My, our program at Loyola Marymount is Yoga Meets Modern Medicine. So we have lots of referrals. We also learn how to take what they call soap notes, you know, how they, they all talk to each other with these notes. And uh, the doctors want us to know medical terminology. They're not going to look at Sanskrit names and things like that, you know. So I, I've had quite a bit of interaction uh, with doctors, and there's some great ones out there. But I think, you know, I, I, I lean more towards the natural way. But there's sometimes, you know, if you've got a nasty cold and it's it's and you're going into your lungs and you know you're laid up, you know, sometimes you need the antibiotics. You know, if you yeah. have uh, you break your leg, you need an operation. You know, so there's. I really believe in the what you call the integrated medicine approach, where you know they all work together. Yes, yes, that holistic. If you have to go synthetic <laughs> once in a while, you know, okay. Well, but no, I mean, try to stay. We need yeah. meds, um, and to save our lives, you know, uh, and people that are diabetics. You know, now people who are type two diabetics, there's a lot more breakthroughs and things. Uh, mm-hmm. <clears throat> So, uh, but there are certain just conditions where you really, in my opinion, you just, you need to be with meds and there are certain things that you can, you can go with supplements just depending on what it is. And that's why it's good to work with a great health professional. Well, that's what you are to me. Well, I you. consider you a great health professional for sure. Um, I was wanting to get, talk about this one pose that, um, the warrior pose, uh-huh. you know, do you think the blossoming of positivity comes from the poses such as the warrior pose from its well, open body language and empowering stance? Well, first of all, all of the yoga postures have psychological effects and physiological effects. So the Sanskrit name of the warrior is Veera Bhadrasana. Mm-hmm. And the warrior poses were used at the top of a mountain to signal the troops below to inspire them. Hmm. So you ask yourself the question when you're doing the mount, the uh, warrior, uh, am I, do I feel like a warrior at the top of a mountain uh, inspiring the troops? <laughs> and I feel the, like, <laughs> the, I feel like the that way, I do. warrior and all the standing postures are really nice. Uh, and the particular warrior posture works each side of the body separately. So you do it with the right leg, you do it with the left leg. And so many people, you know, uh, are out of whack just because they've been right-handed or left-handed for a long time. Think about it. So by the time you hit 40 or 50, you've been right-handed for a long time, left-handed. So when you do these postures that are called asymmetrical, you work each side of the body separately, they're very helpful. So you can do them to arch, you can do them to fold, you can do them to, to go into lateral flexion sideways, you can do them to twist, and you work each side of the body separately. I think they're very helpful, and the warrior is a great one. Um, when you were talking about the twist, um, you were saying that certain certain movements are not good for certain kind of problems as far as the back goes. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are some things that... You know, somebody out there that might be going to another class, you know, and they're participating in a class and they don't understand that they shouldn't be doing these things if they have, say, sciatica or degenerative. You know, Samantha, it's um, such a broad yes. question because there's so many kinds of facts. So I'll just try to answer it in the best way I can. That Please do. The majority of the people can. in the United States and the world bend forward too much. Okay. You think about it. You wake up in the morning, you get out of your bed, you sit on the edge of your bed, you bend forward, you go in the bathroom, you take care of some business, you sit and bend forward, you get ready to go somewhere, you're over the sink, you bend forward. If you live in a place where you're driving a car, you sit and bend forward. Then you go to work, you've got a computer de- there, and you sit and bend forward, and you come home and answer your personal emails so your eyes get blurry and bend forward. We just bend forward too much. So most of the problems with the back 
or from bending forward too much. So you have like lumbar strain, you have sciatica, disc problems, you know, uh, uh, unstable uh, SI joint, all those kinds of things, often from bending forward too much. So most of us need to do some kind of arching. And, you know, if you just take a deep breath, that's a back bend. So it goes from that to lying on the ground, pressing yourself up into a cobra, which not everybody can do. So I would say the majority of the back problems that I see are from people who bend forward too much and have oh, Larry, weak abdominal muscles and tight hamstring muscles. Our time has come by already. Oh my You've God. been listening to The People Speak with your host, Samantha Legend. I'd like to thank our guest, Larry Payne, and remind you to go to his website, samata.com, and buy his book, Yoga for Dummies, thank Yoga you. Rx, and the many DVDs to boost immunity and overall health. And the new one, Join yoga us therapy next and integrative week. Medicine. Say that again. And the brand new one, yoga therapy and integrative medicine. Can't wait to get it. Join and us next will. week, 9 p.m. Eastern, when our guest will be Jesse Ventura on BBS Radio. Thank you. One bright sunny morning in the shadow of the sea by the relief of us. I saw my people And they stood there hungry And I stood there wondering If this land was made for you and me This land is your land This land is my land From California To the New York Island Redwood forest to the Gulf Stream waters. Yeah, this land was made for you and me.